On the M621 between Bradford and Leeds, PCs Rob Jones and Mick Roth are on patrol. They're part of the Yorkshire and the Humber Regional Roads crime team. Their job is to target and disrupt criminal activity on the roads. We hunt in packs um, and we, we, we work in pairs, whereas in the past you might be on your own, you might think twice about stopping a car or you might lose something by hesitating because you, you don't have the strength in numbers. We have the strength in numbers. Uh, we have the team readily available to deal with any, any issue. They're ordered into Bradford, where a car linked to a burglary is being pursued through the city. But the local patrol cars have lost it. Now it's up to Rob and Mick, teamed up with another unmarked car to track it down. All we have to go on there, uh, we had a partial registration and, uh, and not much else really. So really, strength in numbers, uh, there was lots of us about. We just flooded the area, hoping that this car would appear at some point. Almost immediately, they come across a car fitting the description. The tension's building until you get close to it and you see, yeah, that's the car that we're after, that's the one we're interested in. XW X-ray Tango, this is it, this is five, it. Six. In this situation, the cops are trained to manoeuvre one of their vehicles ahead of the car and force it to stop. Ideally, I'd like to have used two vehicles to, even if we have to make contact with it, to stop it. But just as they attempt to make the stop, the radio link between the two police cars fails. This is it, Lima Mike one two. This is it, this is it, Ross. With the, the comms dropping out for those few seconds, it meant we couldn't get his heads together and, and work out what we were going to do. The delay allows the driver of the car to work out what's going on and he puts his foot down. Yeah, vehicle's lit up. This guy is going to drive like a lunatic. We are in a pursuit situation. It is failing to stop at this time. Yeah, vehicle is making off. We're on uh, Speeton Avenue. Speed is 55 five miles per hour. Mission of TPAC now, please. When you first shout up on the radio and you you tell the control you've got one failing to stop. I always feel like my voice is trembling. The speed is now 80 miles per hour. You're kind of concerned that if the control room hears that, they're going to think that you're not properly in control. We've got brake action, uh, approaching traffic lights, stand by. Which is not true, it's just, uh, like I say, it's the adrenaline having the effect that adrenaline has. Their best chance of stopping the driver safely will be with the help of air support. It gives us the ability to just back off, take the pressure out of the pursuit, uh, and ultimately we know in the in your back of your mind if the helicopter's there, they're not getting away. Yeah, extra tango 56, still great on road. Uh, is the helicopter available, please? The helicopter isn't available and the motorway cops are on their own. But the car is now heading towards Bradford's narrow back streets. Yeah, he's more than likely a local lad. He'll know those roads like the back of his hands. So it's quite difficult to put a sort of a coherent strategy into place to stop him when he knows where he's going. Um, you know, it's his home patch at the end of the day. The odds are stacking up against the cops, but they're determined to keep the courser in their sights. Just four miles from the back streets of Bradford, the motorway cop team of A.D. Brown and Matt Hemingway are in the middle of their night shift. The, the mundane nine till five, Monday to Friday thing, I, it's not for me. I like to come to work, get the keys, go out and um, not know what's coming. Tonight, A.D. and Matt are en route to the M621 on the outskirts of Leeds. There's um, been a report that a, uh, a trailer has flipped over and um, we don't know whether it's still in the carriageway or not, so we start on the way down to see if we can make sure everybody's OK and see if we can get it moved. The um, area where we think it's happened, there's a big sweeping bend 
so it's quite possible they've gone round that bend a little bit too fast and the um, the trailers tipped them over so it's there people are not taking much notice any accident on a bend could have serious consequences the burger van is hidden from view and with vehicles coming round the bend at speed the cops need to clear the road as soon as possible Romeo Tango 90 get a speed restriction on please we're flying round here all it takes when you're travelling at 60 miles per hour, in a, especially in a heavy goods vehicle, is losing your concentration for a split second. If you close your eyes for the click of a finger, in, you're driving a big, giant weapon, really. I hate being on motorway. And live lanes and that, it's awful. People just don't slow down. It's an awful place where you feel really exposed to these vehicles that are flying past you. And sometimes I think that people don't realise that. The burger van survived the crash pretty well. Much better than the Land Rover pulling it. Well, obviously that's been towing this trailer. Um, I'm not quite sure yet why he's lost control of it, but it's become detached and it's come skidding down the motorway. Um, just got a wobble on and it rolled. Did the car. You all right? Everyone okay? Yeah, yeah everyone's, everyone's okay, fine, yeah. thank you. We're all strapped in, so we're, we're okay. The real miraculous thing about this is that nobody else was injured. Anybody could have been following this vehicle uh, at the point when it flipped over. It, it went over into two lanes, and when you come round a bend, you don't expect to see a burger van on its side. So how nobody else ran into it is, is a miracle. Because the van is carrying gas canisters, the fire brigade are on scene as a precaution. The main concern for the cops is getting the van off the motorway quickly, but they discover a problem. When it's come off the car, yeah, there, twisted. it's twisted this. Right. So whether we can somehow... If we, no, yeah, if we can force this round, yeah. Yeah, we'll be able to get onto the X5. This, this should be this way up. That way, so it could sit on the bar. As the motorway cops work out how to shift the trailer, highways agency officers slow the traffic down to prevent an accident. Do you want to try and hook it up a lot? We can't turn that hitch. Well, no, but try and hook it to something else, just a bit of gentle persuasion. Well, I'll tell you what, all four wheels are all right. We've got fire service there, ambulance, highways, everyone and his wife were there. It's not going to get X5 on that. Can't twist it. The longer they debate what to do, the greater the threat from the speeding traffic. If I'm stood there, I'm putting myself at risk and I'm in danger. And I'm certainly not waiting for somebody else's uh, decision to uh, decide what we're going to do with something. So Matt and Aidy decide to clear the road themselves. Yeah, just do the yeah. Yeah, it's fine. It was a little bit no-nonsense the way we got it moved. Yeah, it dug a little bit of the road up when we were doing it, but you ask anybody what would they rather have, a bit of a gouge in the road that needed repairing, or would they rather drive into the back of this burger stall? Um, if it would have been any darker, that could have caused somebody some serious problems coming around that bend. The battered Land Rover is also being moved. We just strapped this vehicle up behind us, it was on its side, and with the assistance at Fire Brigade, we're going to try and right the vehicle with a bit of assistance from us. That's the plan. As the Land Rover is wheeled onto the hard shoulder, the last of the debris is cleared away. Matt and Aidy's job is done, and they can leave the highways agency to reopen the road for traffic to flow freely and safely round the bend again. Back in Bradford, PCs Mick Roth and Rob Jones are still caught up in a dangerous high-speed pursuit and they have their own concerns about what could lie around the next bend. All he has to do is turn a corner during that pursuit and run over a person, a child, and kill them. And, and then it, well, the whole game changes. Mick and Rob don't want to lose the courser, but they also need to keep their distance. You're very conscious not to push them too hard or push them into making manoeuvres that they shouldn't be making. 
because you're very aware that they're not looking at what's in front of them. They're more than likely paying a lot of attention to what's behind them and seeing how close the blue lights are. Speed is now 6 0. Yeah, approaching lights on red, stand by. And it's a left, left, left through the red lights onto Little Orton Lane. Little Orton Lane going downhill. Stand left, left, left onto. Stand by. Safety check. Round a left hand bend. Decamp, decamp. Come on, George, go on. Stand still! What's he dropped? One runner, one runner. Me and us are together. He can run all he likes, he's not going to kill anybody running. Whereas if he, he carries on driving like he was in the car, the, the chances are at some point he's going to have an accident. Now I've gone to ground on the side alley off of where we lost him. Go where you decamp. The drivers vanished into the darkness. I'll keep, I'll keep an eye on this. Just by way of description, um, white male, I would guess 17, 19, 20 years of age, slim build, uh, dark blue, Adidas tracksuit bottoms, dark hooded top, trainers. <laughs> Where this lads run, the last road I gave, there's a school uh, to the offside that we're running up, what appears to be a school. And there's a set of playing fields, and I think the lad's in there somewhere. I think we'd have seen him up there, wouldn't we, Rob? Yeah, he's got to be over here. He couldn't, if he'd gone up there, we'd have seen him. He can't get over that fence. He's got to have dived over here, or in that spare land. A dog team is called in. But they're too late to help. Uh, there's no indications at all leading into that area. All you need to resume unless there's any further requests. Thank you. <sighs> it stings, um, the fact that they've got away, because you always think, what if we'd have had a, another t five minutes and we could have got people and boxed it? What if I'd have done this? What if I'd have done that? Um, and I think if you don't do that, you become complacent and it doesn't make you as sharp. Uh, and you're not as committed anymore. So I think it's good to have that, that sting to say, next time I will be better, next time I will do better. The driver jumped out of the car when it was still moving and it's been badly damaged. He's, um, he's come to decamp here, door open and just smashed it into, he's jumped out and that's carried on and oh, right. into lampposts. Good job, well done. I just thought we'd get him now. Yeah. He's made a mess, hasn't he? Right. The car he was in is displaying one registration plate. The tax disc in that car, he's displaying another. So I'm tipping the chances are it's a stolen car. Uh, I've not had a chance to check the registration plate on the tax disc yet. But uh, like I said, the presumption is it's a stolen car. Why else would you change the, the plate? It's been doing burglaries, quite a common thing to do. That way the vehicle can't be traced. So again, it's another line of inquiry. We'll, uh, we'll see how far we get. All they can do now is look for evidence. Rob returns to the alleyway where they lost the driver. You know he's off on his toes and you're not going to get him there and then. Your brain switches to catching him in the long term, if you like. Basically, when the, uh, the lads, when the lads <laughs> decamped and run up that jail, uh, Ross and I have chased after him. And as he's got to a particular point, I've seen something come to the right-hand side. I don't know if he's discarded it or he's just dropped out of his coat, but it's come from him. Uh, after we've completed the search, I've gone back, and the only two items there are the William Hill betting slip from today, with a, a time and a date on, so I'm quite sure the belt to see who got that. And the other thing is, uh, it's one of those shoe covers that you get when you go look around show homes or when Sky come to your house there's still a chance that they can match the betting shop CCTV footage with their own in-car footage to link the driver to the Corsa. You see him drop a glove? He ain't got gloves on as he comes out, which is a bonus, isn't it? I mean, forensically, that's ideal for us, the fact that his fingerprints are going to be somewhere within the um, cabin area of the car. The fact that he's not wearing gloves and our video proves it. And if we find fingerprints or some forensic link to him, you know, he'll have to, he'll have some stern questions to answer as to why his fingerprints are uh, 
<laughs> in the car, so to speak. It's always nice to find something that you think, I know this particular item is going to link this car to the person that's run away, and I can identify the person that's run away through this particular item. So it's always nice, because you know in the long run he's going to be arrested. Both leads will be followed up tomorrow, and as the crime team head back into the centre of Bradford, 15 miles east, officers Phil Stonebanks and Dave Robson are policing the A1 dual carriageway. Even at this hour, Britain's longest road is still busy. Phil and Dave have been called to an accident near Pontefract. Uh, there's one HGV involved and apparently it's blocking lanes two and three. And obviously the A1 is a very busy road, so it uh, could potentially cause some major problems this morning, depending on how quickly we can get it cleared. Yeah, they're also through braking. Flashing amber light that side. There we go, looks promising. Uh, here we go. Stop it here, mate. Stop it here. Yeah. Sorry, say that again, please. The motorway cops' first priority is to assess the scale of the problem they face and alert the control room. Yeah, I'm with the uh, HGV now. Just to let you know, it's been coming uh, southbound. The vehicle is currently jackknifed in the central res. Both carriageways. Uh, are disrupted. The jackknife truck is blocking one of the northbound lanes. The crash barrier and tons of earth have been ripped up and dumped in the southbound lane. It was raining, it was pitch black, there's no street lighting on that particular section. So basically everything was against us. Slow down! Flipping heck! I remember Phil like screaming down the radio saying, look, we need these traffic slowing, make sure they're stopping because they were just flying by us. Slow down! Use your eyes! Still doing at silly speeds, considering there's been an accident, it's raining, there's debris on the road, and there's people stood in the carriage way, you know, including police officers and highway agency officers. Use your eyes! They don't slow down. They don't give us the time and the space that we need to try and restore things back to normality. That's what's so annoying. And people lose their lives because of that. It's, it's very frustrating. We are just trying to get things back as they should be, uh, and people just do not respect us for that. They don't appreciate what we're trying to do. Cheers, mate. Thanks. My wife, I think, probably does worry about me when I go to work. She never really says as much, but uh, you always know that uh, you know, she, she's got that worry at the back of her mind. As the block lanes are coned off, Dave tracks down the driver of the jackknifed HGV. What happened? The deer skipped across just ahead of the junction. So the deer ran out from which side? Just ahead of the junction there. The driver swerved to avoid a deer that jumped out in front of him. And what did you have to do? What was your immediate reaction, you say? Well, the first thing I did was I swerved into the left. I suppose it's just a natural instinct. You're driving along, something runs out in front of you, and uh, you just swerve to try and avoid it. Assuming that's uh, what has happened, but uh, he's been very lucky. It could have been uh, very nasty, could this? It's obviously going to cause some chaos for the uh, duration until we can get the vehicle moved, but uh, he's, uh, he's been very fortunate. We're going to have to put a full closure on both ways, aren't we? Uh, Can't it's, leave it there, can you? No, it's certainly lucky that way. I mean, speed these are coming down. I've got yeah. signs out, but they're still early down at yeah. 50, 60 mile an hour. Closing the entire dual carriageway is a drastic step to take on such a major road, especially now. It's now just nearly five in the morning. I bet I'd call this time about the start of the rush hour around here. Um, we're getting a lot more and more traffic. It's going to be chaos before long. The motorway cops will keep the road open until a recovery team arrives to move the jackknifed HGV. But with only one lane open, traffic is already building up, and one part of the road is worrying Phil. A bit of concern about um, the bend up there, where the vehicles are going to be queuing back round the bend, causing further tailbacks and the possibility of another accident happening in the tailback. In these wet and dark conditions, the tailback just ahead of the bend could be hidden to oncoming drivers who may not have time to react.
20 miles east near Wakefield. Officers Doug Lofthouse and Paul Heaton are responding to another emergency call for help. Yeah, we're sorted now, thank you. At the moment, all we've got is a vehicle's collided with a lamppost. It's in two halves and we're uncertain whether anybody's injured or not. The crash sounds severe. The cops have to assume that someone could be seriously injured. But the crash is 15 miles away in a housing estate that Doug and Paul are unfamiliar with. And it's taking them longer to get there than they'd like. Not only is absolutely miles away, isn't it? The other side of Castleford, isn't it? Yeah. When they eventually get to the scene, the car is surrounded by a group of drunk lads. No! 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 What's happened with here then? Lads just Someone smashed into my brother's now. house. Although the car isn't in two pieces as reported, it's still severely damaged. Is it your car? No. What's his no. name? We haven't charged him for parking though, don't worry. When you see a group of four to six young adult males that are all well in drink, well, it's quite fair to say that are drunk, and you look at a car, you've got to sometimes put two and two together and you think, are any of those people there that have been involved in this collision, whether they're the driver? I don't want you shouting in my ear all You can't do it, you can't do it. Yeah, you can't do it. You can't do it. Yeah, can. Oh, don't push me. No, you pushed into me. No, you pushed into me, mate. You pushed into me. Listen, listen, if you've got no better to do than stand around here and act like an idiot, that's fine, isn't it? You carry on. You carry on. You carry on. You carry on. You're telling me. If you were all right, you know what I mean? You're telling me. A job like that can quickly, uh, or very quickly, not spiral out of control, but become very, very difficult unless somebody admits to being driving. Right, let's is, roll it, by is it one now? Right. See you later. Always oh, late. But the driver is not one of the drunks. He's gone missing. Paul's immediate concern is to find him in case he was injured in the crash. The problem you, you have in impacts like this is internal injuries. No. I mean, if it at door. That's all intrusion, he would have been, wouldn't he? Yeah. Had the impact from the lamppost have been six inches further across towards the driver's side, uh, this could have quite easily been a fatality, no doubt about it. Uh, the intrusion would have been far greater, as in the, uh, the car would have pressed possibly further in and maybe uh, hit the driver, uh, just as it has here, as you can see how much it's bent in. Just as Doug prepares to go looking for the driver, he turns up. Is he all right? Yeah, I've got a... He said he's suffering from back pain. Yeah. I've sorted out um, an ambulance just to check him over. Has he been drinking? Oh, he's been drinking all right, yeah. What, what we're going to do... Please, please yeah, it, what we're going to do is quick breath test. Yeah. Well, we'll have to wait till this ambulance turns up. How are you doing, Paul? I'm all right, mate. I've, I've been silly. I've had a couple of drinks. I ain't going <laughs> to lie, you know what I mean? I've had a couple of drinks. I've been silly. Um, slipped up the road there, straight into the lamppost, you know what I mean? So. Although he wasn't, in my opinion, drunk, he was definitely under the influence of obviously being drinking alcohol, just with the way his reactions were and you're looking at his eyes and obviously probably quite shocked, really, from what's gone on. I mean, I ain't going to be stupid and run off or out like that. I mean, I'm a drunk. No, no, we're more concerned. Yeah. Look at the damage of the car. We're more concerned about you. Yeah, I mean, I mean I've got a bit of back injury here, but... A very lucky... Lucky young man, really, to come away unscathed with a collision like that. So, what's the worst that can come out of this? What's what? I mean, I mean, obvi obviously, my, uh, Gavin, my license is going to be straight. What, driving offence-wise. Yeah. Like, if you're like, over the drink drive limit, then you you you'll be banned. Yeah, I, I gathered that. You know. Yeah. So, How much have you lost? Quite a bit. No, 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 no. More than two pints. Well, I guess that yeah, because I've been drinking them like little like little. Stubbies, yeah, yeah. How old are you? I'm, I'm 19, mate. I'm not really anti-people uh, drinking, if that's what they want to do. Maybe it's me that's a little bit... Uh, not, not got much air to let down now, so uh, maybe I don't go out anymore, but I'm definitely not anti-drinking. Uh, however, I am when it comes to uh, getting behind the wheel of a car. Uh, even having the smallest amounts, it's going to impair some of your uh, decision-making and people think, as a, a general rule, I can go and have two pints. Well, it doesn't quite work like that. Uh, everybody's different, and my simple rule that I tell everybody, whether that's the uh, people I deal with or my own, uh, my own son who's driving, is have absolutely nothing if you're going to drive. 
80% of drivers aged between 17 and 24 are unaware of the drink driving limit. I'll hold it for you. If you want to lean forward a bit, I know it's a bit difficult. Right, so deep breath and blow. Sit, keep on going like that. Keep on going. That's it. And he's looking at then going to court if he's over the limit, losing his licence, which then can have knock-on effects of losing his job, losing his house. So what it's doing, it's just analysing the uh, breath sample that you've just given. It'll give us a reading. What's that? You've passed. You've passed. Have I passed? Yeah, you you won one microgram under. under the drink drive limit. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean, like I've told you, I'm being truthful. I've, I've I've had a couple of them stubbies. That's it. You won under. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, had that gone above that, you'd. Have... So, I'm, I mean, I mean, I'm grateful for that, but I'm not grateful. You know, I mean, I, I don't no, mean to be in this lucky. situation right now. You know what I mean? <laughs> he came back and blew 34, and the legal limit's 35. So he was extremely lucky. But um, I thought that was, I thought that was high then. Is that your car then? Yeah, it is. Yeah, I mean, I've got it on finance, you know. Have you? Yeah. I hope you're insured. Well, I've got. Oh yeah, oh, yeah I'm insured. Like, I just third yeah. party fire and theft. That's third all. Part. Yeah, third party fire and theft. That's what I mean. Having only third party insurance means that the driver won't have to stump up to fix the lamppost, but he'll get no payout for his wrecked car. I mean, if I got it on uh, right. fully comp like it, it'd have been about five, six grand. Right. You know. The cops will report him for driving without due care and attention. You can't get closer than that, can you? Yeah. Tell you what, he's lost a lot of money. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's come back empty, that's the main thing. Yeah. And because his car was on finance and he only had third party insurance, he'll be paying for this accident for a long time to come. The insurance company will not pay out for the damage to his vehicle. Well, in my opinion, that vehicle will be written off. Uh, there were far too much damage to make it repairable. Uh, I'd like to think that somebody like that, that being involved in a collision of that magnitude and coming back one under, will probably make him, I'd like to think, make him think for the rest of his life of, I'm not getting in a car again when I've had a drink, I'll just leave it at home because I'm lucky to be alive, I'm lucky I've got my licence, and guess what, I've got to pay several thousand pounds out for the next few years for nothing. While this young driver contemplates how lucky he's been. 14 miles west in Bradford, Officer Mick Roth is back out on the road and he's now teamed up with PC Ross Masters. Who's in that? What's bait? What's sparing? You get to know how each other works, and in Mick's case, you know that if he starts looking at something, um, it's it's worth the attention. Back office three six. Can you check us one niche? So you know it could just be a, a, an eye glance at a vehicle, and you know that he's interested in that vehicle, and um, you know it, then it snowballs from there. It goes from there basically. It's a lot of passenger seat, man. Yeah, that's good. Just drop him behind him, if you can. What's he doing, this lad? It's amazing what you can tell when, when you get into it and you've done it for a few years, what you can tell from how a car looks. It was a very, very new car, but it had a wheel trim missing. It was dirty. It had some scrapes on it. And straight away, you start to think, well, if I'd paid that amount of money for a brand new Golf like that, I certainly wouldn't have it scraped, nor would it be dirty. And I'm sure all the wheel trims would be there. The car is registered to a woman, but two young men are in it, which raises Ross and Mick's suspicions. Yeah, we'll have him, mate. Engine off, pal. Your car, mate. Um, well, it's not exactly my car, but it's... Oh, whose car is it? Uh, the woman who I'm going to see. It's whose? It's a... And whose whose cars is it my, then? My aunt who will invest in this month. You're allowed to drive it now. Yeah, yeah. Get your hands out your pockets, pal. Put your phone down, mate. Fully insured. Fully insured on it. Yeah. How come you're insured on um, your auntie's? Because I'm the main driver. I look after her on a carer. Oh, do you? All right, yeah. enough. 
It's in a bit of action, this motor, mate, hasn't it? It's all a bit banged up, isn't it? Tell me For a 61 it. plate, like. Yeah, tell me about it. Have you been in Bollywood Police before, mate? Uh, what for? A few years ago, just you driving can't. offences or so. Never. Just put interior light on for us, lads. There's a funny smell coming from in here. Mm. Cannabisy kind of smell. <laughs> you sure? Yeah. All right. We'll just check you through, mate, and as long as you're all right, you're on your way, lads, honestly. Okay. Mick's speaking with the two lads, and I'm looking at the passenger, and he's, he's nervous. Um, and he's twitching, he's constantly sort of, uh, he's looking straight ahead. Um, he was almost shaking, and at that point, you think something's not right. You look a bit nervous, pal. Have you got what you shouldn't have, lads? No. The worst thing about our job is, uh, and potentially the best thing, is you get to spot a liar straight away. And as soon as you spot a liar, you think, there's more to it. Ross radios the control room to check up on the two men. The passenger has no record, but the driver is well known to the police. Uh, possession of Class A, got violence markers for assaulting a police officer in 2007. That is everything you don't want to hear when you're talking to somebody. Because at any moment, if he's done it in the past and he's had the mindset in the past to do it, he may do it again. So I'm potentially looking at a threat there. You've done for drugs before? It was only going to go one way. They were always going to be detained and searched. Just pop out for us. Just face card, just put your hands up rule for us. Have you got anything on you, Shunta, fella? Uh, I've got something in my wallet. You've got what, sorry? Something in my wallet. What have you got in your wallet? I've got, like, a bit of cocaine. A bit of cocaine? Yeah. All right, fella. Yeah. What's that for? Oh. Just because you're being detained for purposes of a search? Yeah. You ever been in trouble for drugs before? No. Right from, you know, being a teenager, I've always been against drugs uh, of any type um, that are illegal. And, <laughs> yeah, people have different stances, don't they? For me, any drug that's illegal shouldn't have it, and we'll, I'll deal with them for it. A uh, little bit of cocaine. He admitted to having it before I started searching him. It's probably about a gram. You got anything else, else on you you shouldn't have? No, no, you'll see when you yeah. Although they found some drugs on the passenger, the driver has nothing on him. Where's that cash from? My cash, um, money, my benefits, yeah, like benefits, like looking after her. Show us in here? No. But a search of the car soon reveals what Mick is looking for. Or is it pills? About 30 pills. Just next to the driver's console there, there's about um, 30 tablets. Like street rats in a plastic wrap. A further search of the car reveals more drugs. White rock like substance, which is going to be uh, probably crack cocaine as well. And something else. You shouldn't have that, mate, should you? I know, it's more of a novelty thing. You have to come down to Nick for that, mate. Honestly, yeah. I might have some barkers. A lock knife, mate. He's got a lock knife, door pocket. Shouldn't have that. The fact that it's in the driver's door pocket says so many other things. He's probably going to be right-handed. He'll be able to reach down, produce it, use it, should he need to at a moment's notice. To me, that just shows a level of intent. Um, if you had a lock knife in the boot, then, yeah, OK, you've got a lock knife, you shouldn't have it, but it's in the boot, it's not readily available. This guy had that knife there, in my opinion, to use it to protect himself. Boys, it gets worse, doesn't it? It gets worse. You should not have that either. So to me, it started to, to paint a really, really worrying picture. What began as a routine stop is snowballing into a significant drugs bust. It's a never-ending situation, but you can't just give up. If you stop dealing with these people for drugs and, and stop taking people off the streets and, you know, and, and trying to get the, the different levels of, of criminality off the streets, it would get overrun. You, know, you can't not stop doing it. What's all this, mate? From my mate's garden. It's from, it's from your mate's garden? Yeah, you always get round it though. It's from his mate's cannabis garden. No. Boys, at this moment in time, uh, you're both under arrest on position we intend to supply controlled drugs. All right. You're also both under arrest. You're still under caution for possession of an offensive weapon as well. They'll both be taken out to the police station and booked in, but primarily now we need to get some searches done. Now the cops have found drugs in the car, they have the power to search the driver's home address. As they organise a raid, 
15 miles away on the A1 at the site of the jackknife lorry, officers Phil Stonebanks and Dave Robson are still fighting to reopen the blocked lanes. And time is against them. My mum always said if I didn't work hard at school, I'd end up sleeping in the streets. She was right. The tailback caused by the accident is now stretching over 500 metres towards a bend in the motorway. Traffic was just starting to build up. Um, the early morning risers were on the way to work or were just starting work. It was starting to get busy with lorries and cars. Uh, and it was quite obvious that traffic was quickly going to start tailing back. A lane has been kept open in each direction to keep traffic moving. But there's still a long tailback. We know there's going to be some backlog. And you always think that you try and make it safe so there isn't going to be another accident. And with any accident, it could be from bumper to bumper up to the worst of fatal. And you, you never expect it. You never want to think about that happening. As they wait for a recovery team to shift the HGV, a call comes in over the radio. It's just what the cops feared. Another bomb just further down now. 9-0, is that another one down here somewhere? There's been a, uh, another accident uh, between two articulated goods vehicles. Uh, one's run into the back of the other one and it's uh, potentially quite serious. Go. You get that? So, yeah, it's looking back down here. Yeah, down there. Yeah, the information is that uh, this one on the northbound is uh, confirmed fatality. That's uh, in the tailback heading up to the uh, first RTC, so we're just heading down there now to assist, it's just literally round the corner. What a mess. When I got to the scene and saw the state of the lorry, um, it was a pretty harrowing sight. Tragically, the driver of the lorry hasn't survived. The, the engine smashed the pieces in this, where you can see that he's no way surviving there. The gearbox had been smashed out, the prop shaft had been smashed out. That's the most damage I've seen to a lorry in my 17 years as a traffic officer. It was horrendous. Jesus. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's obviously as bad as it gets is this one. Uh, you know, we've had one fairly minor incident up there where the lorry's uh, allegedly swerved to miss a deer. As a result of that, it's caused tailbacks around the corner around here. Uh, there's a lorry here which has obviously had to stop. This one obviously hasn't managed to stop in time. And as you can see from the state of the cab, there's uh, uh, unfortunately, no way that uh, the poor guy could have survived it. You've just got to be professional at the end of the day. You've got to take your emotional head off, stick that on one side uh, and do the job that you're paid to do. Uh, the families would expect that from you. Um, it's what everybody expects from you. So you've just got to remain professional throughout and, and do what you get paid to do. Because there's been a fatality, this will now be treated as a crime scene. The cause of death needs to be investigated and Dave takes detailed statements from witnesses. The driver whose truck took the full force of the HGV colliding with it from behind is being treated for injuries to his neck and back. Hey, you know, can I just uh, get a few details before he goes and... Uh, what do you remember happening? Uh, the matrix were on. Yeah. Telling us to slow down. Just slowing down. Because uh, I was in the outside lane originally. Right, okay then. Uh, like I say, someone will come and speak to you and just jot it down in, in writing later on. Right, thank you very much. Cheers. We know on this time, uh, matrixes were set to slow people down. We don't know what has happened and the reason why, but that should have slowed the traffic down. The HGV hit the end of the tailback with such force, it caused a domino effect, pushing three trucks into one another and then finally shunting into a BMW. Cool. While they investigate the accident, the traffic continues to build up. 
and the knock-on effects from this will be felt for miles around. That all became part of one big accident scene. Uh, the scene was locked down for, I believe, it was about 15 hours. The, the A1 was closed, which ca obviously caused horrendous problems um, for anyone who was wanting to use that road or even the surrounding area. The motorway cops will be on duty all night to reduce the chaos caused by diverting thousands of vehicles to B roads surrounding the crash site. Go on. Back in Bradford, Mick and Ross are still dealing with the two men stopped with drugs in the car. You're proper in trouble, mate, yeah? What for? Fuck knives and all it's drugs. Not fine, is it? Well, I've... you're in car. You're in frame. It's my friend. I well, there's drugs in that. your back pocket as well. Yeah, I said that was my own personal use. Wanted to. Well, we'll see what happens, mate. Yeah. The cops have sent a search team to raid the driver's property in Bradford city centre. Yeah, they pay minimal rent. I'll get given it and just treat it like. Melts, frost, snow, and ice. That's what this is, From same stuff. Steps, paths and driveways. It's often mixed with cocaine to bulk out supplies and increase profits. He's got a mortar and pestle here, so he's obviously uh, got this other agent, the, the doorstep defroster, um, and he's bashing that up and mixing it with something else and passing that off. We can, that's all we can surmise at this stage. But then they find the something else stuffed down the back of a sofa. So I bet that's coke, and then he's bashing it in with that. It's a fair bit of coke if it is. In the bedroom, there are more drugs. I mean, he's set of digital scales and, and what just may well be uh, cocaine on the top of it there. Um, there's a little knife there, so he's possibly been cutting that up and weighing it prior to bagging and selling. Unfortunately, drugs are everywhere. Um, I'm sure there's not one place in the UK where you can go that if you needed a illegal drug, you could make a phone call and it'd be with you in 10 minutes. Um, that is the level of the trade that members of the public really are kind of blissfully unaware. Uh, and I'd seek to keep them that way almost because I wouldn't like to know the real horror and the real scale of the, the level of drugs in our society because it is huge. They also find equipment which can be used to grow cannabis. Growing compound there, growing bins. And you've got your large fan units here. Quite a few quid's worth, that's for sure. These are your, uh, your growing tents, silver foil. Just ready to set up. It's quite, quite a lot there, so it might have been quite a sizeable one. That's a heavy duty boy, is that? But it's all here, ready and waiting to go somewhere. With the evidence mounting up, the slow process of logging it begins. Um, so what's going to be the first exhibit from here? Right. Um, Cannabis. Growth preparation equipment. <laughs> TWG one. Yeah, I think that's the best way. PC Gillen updates the rest of the team on the progress of their search. Um, we've found everything uh, with regards to a cannabis farm, so we want to just take it and uh, dispose of it somehow. Numerous phones are also seized. They'll be checked for evidence of customer telephone numbers and incriminating texts. Along with the phones, a carload of evidence is bagged and the driver's drugs operation is shut down. Out of the corner of your eye, you spot something which leads you to a car, which ultimately leads you to these two people. And at this point, you can then deal with them positively. You can bring them to justice. You can, you can take them out of the equation. They can be dealt with by the courts. The scale of the find means that Mick will be doing paperwork for the rest of his shift. People will say it's a recreational drug. I've seen how that goes, and it's not pretty, and it ain't nice, and for me, Everyone who I stop and deal with for, for drug supply should be given FT prison sentences, should be given something, some kind of incentive not to continue doing what they're doing um, because ultimately they, they do destroy people's lives. Near Pontefract, accident investigators are looking for evidence to try and determine what caused the fatal crash on the A1. The road remains closed while the central barrier is repaired and diversions set up. 
This morning, PCAD Brown has received a call. An HGV driver has had an accident on one of the B roads running close to the motorway. Yeah, I'm back with you now. Uh, where's this bridge track again, please? Um, Hardwick Road, Hardwick Road, East Hardwick. It would appear that um, a goods vehicle has uh, struck a bridge. I suspect it's obviously going to be uh, over high. Whenever we hear about we've got a, uh, a motorway closure on, it's just a case of we'll wait and see when the next bridge strike's going to happen and uh, we'll kind of guess where it's going to be. It will always happen. I mean, normally if they are going quite slow and they just catch it, they're normally still under it. I do. <laughs> All right. I am. Better than, uh, better than that. I've got recovery jacked up to come for the uh, for the trailer, but uh, we're going to need to sort something out regarding the the flow of traffic. Uh, there's a very shaky drive. Evans are going to struggle to turn around down there, aren't they? The wagons are. I think there's even a bus stuck as well. Are we at Tango Seven One? You're all right. Bit of, enough. bit of a shock. Yeah, you're not hurt though. Is cab all right? Uh, aye, I think so. Where are you I going think. to? Uh, Tuxford. I only cut off here because the motorway was shut last night and I was virtually out of my time. All oh, right. In the first lay by. Yeah, yeah. Oh, he's had an accident. He was really shaken up by that. I can tell he's. Uh, you know, he's sorry for what he's done. It was a bigger shock to him than it was to um, everybody else that's involved, I think. Although we do have a responsibility to investigate incidents and deal with people if they cause minor accidents or committed an offence of dual care and attention, anything like that. You know, it's not, it's not my job to rub his nose in it, really. He wouldn't have been there and uh, caused that accident and crashing into that bridge if the motorway hadn't have been closed. Just go and have a look. Made a job of it, driver. That's fine. I mean, I wish they were going fast. Have you got an eye warning plate up? What you are? It says a near 14 8, but you'd normally get a thing, mate. And plus, uh, I was <clears> on the <throat> diversionary road. I know it's no an excuse. Where's your eye plate? Ah, uh, just, just on the other side. Car, oh, yeah. 14, uh, yeah. The plate in the cab gives the height of the lorry for the driver to check against bridge heights. I'm no mathematician, but that's, that's about three inch too high. <laughs> you... Oh well. That tiny little mistake he's made there, believing he was smaller than he was. Um, it's caused absolute chaos and mayhem. We've had to close an, an arterial route into a, a town uh, for several hours to get it all recovered and you know, all the damage that's been caused, with thousands of pounds worth of damage to his trailer. Well, we might as well try and get some of this shifted then, aren't we? <laughs> Got to do a public spirited bit. But it's not just the roads that are affected. A busy rail line between York and Sheffield has had to be closed. An engineer is inspecting it for damage. This, this one gets hit quite a bit. This yeah. one does, yeah. Why is that? Well, I have no idea because all signs are open. They obviously know the size signs of the bridge. So you must think, oh, well, a couple of inches is not going to matter, but obviously it does. This metal plate, that's the track bed. And if it gets a sustainable sideways push, it makes the track out of line. Obviously, can't run trains. But I've checked all the track and, and nothing's moved up there, so. Obviously, his, his, his lorry is three inch higher than what the bridge permits to go under, and three inches caused that. I don't think, to be honest, he's actually uh, he's actually braked or or even tried to stop before it, get out and have a look and see whether he is or he isn't. Well, yeah, I mean, if you're going to have a go, you're at least. You know, you're going to be less than three inch, you know, a centimetre or something, or at least pull up, get out and have a, have a look at it visually so you can see yourself. But, um, you know, that's it. He's, he's hit the bridge and he'll be dealt with accordingly for that.
The rail track can be reopened, despite what must have been a huge impact. I don't think uh, all the time that they realise just this tiny little thing that they've made a mistake over has caused such a big, um, big effect to everybody. Traffic diverted to this road will face yet another diversion until all the debris can be removed. But at least here, no one's been hurt. On the A1 at the site of the fatal accident, PC Phil Stonebanks is working to get the road yeah. reopened. Uh, it's 20 past eight now. I think we've been here about four hours now. With the A1 shut down, the cops have to keep monitoring the increased traffic on the B roads. Yeah, we've just got an update. We've got the uh, helicopter up now. It's uh, daylight and they're just having a float around the area just to see what the traffic situation is here in the middle in the uh, actual scene itself. Uh, it's shut completely. We're in a sterile area. Uh, but all the surrounding roads uh, around Pontefract and sort of heading down towards Doncaster and such like, it's just absolute chaos now. Because it's unclear why the deceased driver wasn't able to stop in time, the wreckage of his truck is carefully recovered and removed for examination. We have a duty to investigate that accident uh, for the deceased driver and for his family, just to find out exactly what happened. It could have been a mechanical fault on his vehicle. His brakes might have failed. We don't know until we've analysed it in the minutest detail, just to find out exactly what did cause the accident. Six miles away, in a vehicle recovery yard near Wakefield, police accident investigator Keith Rayner sees the HGV wreckage for the first time. It's unfortunately typical of two HGVs being involved in accidents. You have so much energy, you have so much weight, uh, you only see this when you've got multiple HGVs or commercial vehicles. The HGV's tachograph records speed and distance. It reveals the truck didn't slow down before impact. His, his tachograph at the moment, the, the download, just shows basically a constant speed in the region 50 mile an hour. Uh, is it because he hasn't seen anybody slowing down and he hasn't slowed down? or because he couldn't slow down. And that's the issue that we're, we're, we're trying to establish. The answer may lie with the truck's braking systems. Is, is there any way we can connect something up to get something to work? Uh, if not, we have to look at the individual components, activate them. So we sort of start at one end and work back as far as we, we, we can. So we can't check every component on the vehicle because of the damage. The components we have checked haven't given us any indication that we've got anything wrong. The truck's got multi-systems to activate all the brakes. It's unlikely that you're going to get a failure of every one to cause a total catastrophic failure. They also inspect the truck's headlights to see if they were on at the time of impact. I don't know if you can see that. Just... If you look at the, the distortion of the, the, the filament, it stops so quickly that even the filament wants to carry on going. And being in effect white hot, it just continues. So that's a definite indication, or a good indication the headlamp was on at the time of impact. To find out if the brake lights were on too, Keith is looking for the same kind of filament distortion. Nothing, is there? Like that headlamp one that we looked at, if the filament's distorted, it would suggest that it's been hot when it was distorted. But none of these are distorted. The evidence is inconclusive, but points towards human error. At the moment, there's nothing standing out with this to me that would cause me a concern. If you haven't got out wrong with the road, you don't have out wrong with the vehicle, you're down to the operator of the vehicle. Why didn't he brake? Nobody really wants to sort of accept that somebody's made a mistake that ends up with such tragic consequences. All the facts that Keith gathers from the examination will go in the report to the coroner, who will determine exactly what caused the accident. 
you always have thoughts about the person that's died. You wonder who they are, what they were doing, have they got any family, have they got any kids? Uh, you know, you, you always think about things like that. You're thinking, that guy turned in for work this morning, got in his lorry, set off to do the job, he's, uh, do the route, he's probably done three or four hundred times for maybe five, ten, twenty years. You always think about them, the number of people that's been affected um, by someone losing their life in such tragic circumstances. At the inquest, the coroner recorded a verdict of accidental death but found the evidence available could not explain why the driver did not slow down or change direction. Police tried to identify the driver of the silver Corsa, pursued by PCs Mick Roth and Rob Jones in Bradford, but all leads have so far proved inconclusive. The young man who crashed his car into a lamppost pleaded guilty to driving without due care and attention. He was fined £100 and given three penalty points on his licence. The driver of the black Volkswagen Golf stopped in Bradford by PCs Mick Roth and Ross Masters pleaded guilty to possession of Class A drugs with intent to supply and possession of an offensive weapon. He received a 33-month prison sentence. The drugs found at the house were confirmed as cocaine and valued at over £5,500. The passenger was not dealing but pleaded guilty to possession of cocaine and was fined £250. And the lorry driver, who crashed his HGV into the bridge, was found guilty of driving without due care and attention. He was fined £170 and received four points on his licence.